there's nothing ahead There's only this vision of you And to it I'm led I've gathered around me Folks who feel like I do And our only passion is to celebrate you We gather together Tears of joy in our eyes Intoxicated Just standing under your sky Hi there. Good morning to you all. Welcome to Hudson First United Methodist Church online worship service this morning. And I pray that you're having the most blessed morning, the blessed day or evening, if you're tuning in in the evening time. And I uh, am so thankful that you're here worshiping with us today. What a blessing that is. So I welcome you all. My name is Pastor Brian. I'm leading us in the service this morning, and grace and peace be unto you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a blessing also it is to be able to worship in this way. We were just talking earlier over at our church. Um, right now I'm at the Parsonage office, but uh, over at the church we are having a little talk about how technology is such a blessing, and we can also talk about how hard it is and how, you know, the, the downside. But Thankfully, we can worship in this way and we're able to join together in this way. And again, I thank you for coming and worshiping with us today. We're going to pray. We're going to have a, some scripture time. We're going to sing together and we're going to have a message as well. And it's an exciting time because, uh, well, I'll tell you later about the message. Anyway, it's uh, time to get into our worship. I don't really have any announcements. If you're in the area, I guess I do have one. Um, we are canceling our Gary Step meeting, uh, our visioning meeting, and moving it from the 22nd to the 29th. So, you know, also uh, there's a big egg extravaganza um, Easter egg hunt for the children on April 1st. It's not a joke. It's not April Fool's joke. It is on April 1st. And it's going to be at the high school. Uh, the United Hudson Churches are doing it. We're doing it all together. So it's ecumenical and it's exciting. We are doing more and more stuff together as different denominations. So it's it's wonderful. Anyhow, let's get to our service today, and I welcome you all again. And I guess I could say we celebrated St. Patrick's Day yesterday. Today, um, as I record this and give this service, yesterday was St. Patrick's Day, and tomorrow will be two days. Anyway, uh, for that, I'll say, may your glass be ever full, may your roof be always strong, and may you be in heaven a half hour before the devil knows you're dead. That's... Uh, that's an Irish toast, so I thought I'd share that with you. Let's go to our worship today. We're going to our call to worship, and it is um, up here on the screen. When we hunger, we cry to the Lord, help us, O Lord. When we thirst, we cry to the Lord, help us, O Lord. God, who created the heavens and the earth, hears our cries. Lord, come and quench our thirst and heal our hunger. Let us place our trust in God, for God alone provides for our every need. Amen to that. Amen. So let's move on to our opening hymn this morning, and it is going to be, uh, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. 
And so you might recognize the tune, which I did. The words are new to me, but I love learning new songs. It's good to sing the old ones, but it's always good to learn a new one. So let's go to the Lord in our worship praise and lift our voices and thanksgiving as we remember all that the Lord has done for us. I love that rolling drum and the cymbal crash. Anyway, will you pray with me? Well, spring of eternal life, you, Lord, are that for us. You are the living water. We come to you this day having drunk deeply of those waters. So often we go to the well of anxiety and despair. Bring to us your living water. Reveal to us your way, your truth, life. Quench our thirsting souls, Lord, for we offer this prayer to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah, speaking of thanks, uh, I almost said Thanksgiving Day, St. Patrick's Day. I was on the wrong uh, holiday. So that opening song, if you sat through the slideshow, the prelude, uh, that's Kaylee Rain, and I did their music before, and it's just, I figured it, it fit because they're a Celtic, Irish, um, Christian rock band. So Kaylee Rain, check it out. It's pretty cool. Now let's uh, move on to our service. So we'll move on to our opening, excuse me, our first scripture reading. Get it up here on the screen for you. And it's Exodus 17, 1 through 7. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? 
But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. The Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? Here ends our first scripture reading. May the Lord add his blessing to the hearing and the reading of his word this morning. Amen. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer, shall we? Um, we have a lot to pray for. I I mean, this whole service could be filled with things we should pray for and people we should pray for and situations and we trust that the Lord knows what's happening because God is omnipresent, God is omniscient, God is omnipotent. So we're not praying to him for anything that he doesn't already know we need, yet we still need to do that. We still need to reach out to God and cry out to the Lord and rely on the Lord and speak to him as often as we can. So uh, we do go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, so let's take a moment in silence as we Think of those people and situations that we need to pray for. Of course, we pray for those who are fighting for their freedom, uh, who are losing their loved ones um, in Ukraine. We pray for those who are having to deal with all these um, situations around our country. Uh, we're a country divided, and it is scary to many people. It's um, it's hard to see everything happening. Um, so let's pray for patience, understanding, and um, just somehow to this can be resolved. So, well, let's go to the Lord in silence for a moment. Gracious God, you are ever present. You are all power. You are all knowledge and truth and wisdom. There's nothing that we could ever do on our own, Lord. So we turn to you this morning and ask that you may continue to help us to remember that you are in charge, that you are providing for us the nourishment of life. We recognize, Lord, that we could not even exist for a moment if you were not within us and sustaining us. You are the living water. Pour out your mercy on us. Wash us clean and make us true disciples. Help us move from the paths of selfishness and stubbornness to the channels of hope and peace. Enable us to place our whole trust in your love as we brought the names of those near and dear to us to your throne of grace and prayer. Remind us again that you also hold us dearly and offer to us your healing grace. Lord, we fall to our knees and accept that healing. Your grace is everything, Lord. It's what sustains us what allows us to grow and reach heaven. So we thank you. Thank you for salvation. Keep us strong and give us courage to go forth while we're in this life and do all that you need us to do, Lord. We pray for our church. We pray for our churches. We pray for our community, for our schools. Watch over our children, Lord, your children. Protect them, guide them. Lift them up, 
Shine your light through them. Help them to, to know you. We pray for our government. We pray for peace. Peace in our country, peace in our world, peace in our lives, peace in our souls. And that's only found in you, Lord. So help us to continue to pray to you, lift up our thoughts and voices and singing and everything that we do in our lives, our, our actions, all in your name, Lord. We pray to you today as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for praying with us today, and it's a wonderful thing. It's hard to describe the feeling praying. I'm sitting in front of a computer screen, yet I can feel the souls that are praying together for this prayer that we're together for. There's no time, real, there's no time and space as we know it here on earth in heaven. So we know that we are together in that way. Anyway, I'm so thankful that you pray with us and moving on with our service today. Uh, we're going to go to our second scripture reading and it is going to be um, John 4 verses 5 through 26. So it's um, a bit of a long one, but it's the story of the Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman at the well. And you know, that's kind of hard to break up. You got to put it mostly together in one story. So let's go to um, our scripture here, John 4, 5 through 26. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Excuse me a moment. I always forget to do that. <laughs> and I went through the trouble to make it, so I had to bring it up. I think I say that every week, too. <laughs> well, what I was going to tell you about the message today is that um, Elizabeth, my wife, I was writing the sermon, and it took me quite a while to write it. And I was almost finished. And she said, well, I, I went to her and I said, what do you think about this idea? And so we had a discussion and we were talking about the woman at the well. And she said, you know, I just read a, an article the other day that talks about the woman at the well. And it's really interesting. And she described it for me. And she said, maybe you should let, you know, she talked for a while. Maybe you should let me do the sermon. And I was like, yes, you should. You should do the sermon. And I went back and I finished my sermon thinking that that was just, you know, not serious, which I don't mind, but um, so she comes to the office and she goes, I sent it to you. I was like, you sent what to me? The sermon. Oh, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> so yeah, no problem, yeah. So the sermon today is written by Elizabeth Comiskey and it is told by me, uh, Pastor Brian. And I just wanna say that it took me, well, I don't wanna, tell you how long it took me to write sermon. I mean, it wasn't days or anything, but it took me quite a while. It took her a half hour. And now just, you know, listen to the words and I'm not asking you to judge it, but I am asking you to realize what's written here and that it took a half hour. <laughs> but she is an author. Anyway, some of you already know this uh, about Elizabeth, by the way, that we grew up in the Midwest and we met in Tombstone, Arizona, so she writes, <clears throat> if you don't remember, Tombstone is the home of the OK Corral. It was the site of the big showdown between Wyatt Earp and the brothers of Wyatt Earp and against the Clanton gang. Still, to this day, you can go there and see the actual OK Corral and the Birdcage Theater and the Crystal Palace Saloon and all the rest of those historical places. Each of those places have a daily show, basically. A historical reenactment, you know what I mean? It's where they reenact certain parts of history that happened in the area. Of course, the OK Corral gunfight. So you can pretty much, anytime you're walking around in the downtown area, which is all um, road, you know, dirt roads still and boarded sidewalks, you walk around this town and you see cowboys and lawmen with their wide brim hats and their spurs clinking and the six shooters on their side and the holsters and understand though that there are legitimate cowboys and police officers and those are important and respected vocations. But these guys on the street are not that. <laughs> Mostly they're drifters who are looking to earn enough tips to pay for their bar tab on any given night. The young women in Tombstone had jokes about them they said, what do you get when you line up 32 tombstone cowboys in a row? You get a full set of teeth. Another one, what do you call a tombstone cowboy without a woman or a girlfriend? Homeless. So there you go. There's jokes, you know, sometimes nowadays how helpless men are without their women. And maybe that's true in many ways, but the truth is that throughout history, Women have literally been helpless without a man. That's just the way it was. Now, please don't misunderstand. I am in no way saying that women are inferior and need a man to get them through life. What I'm saying is that for millennia, women have had their rights stripped away. In the past, and even now in many places, women were 
and are forbidden from receiving a proper education, from traveling freely, from man, from uh, managing their own money, or owning land, or signing a legal contract. None of that was allowed. And sometimes in places in the world, they're still not. What have they done to survive? Well, frankly, they've done whatever they felt they needed to do. And often that involves tying themselves to a man in one way or another. Have you ever heard of a woman getting to, getting to power through her connection to a man? Think about that. If someone were to say, raise your hand, because I'm going to do that in the live service. Now keep it raised if you believe the women, that woman you're thinking of, could have become just as powerful without the man in question. Maybe not too many. We've all seen it. And that brings us to today's story about the Samaritan woman at the well. There are plenty of accounts out there that paint this woman as something of, well, you might call her a hussy. She's a tramp. She gets around. She's had five men in the past, and now she's with a sixth. Many have preached that this woman, this woman at the well was seeking earthly satisfaction in relationships. When she meets Jesus, she realizes the error of her ways and sets her eyes on a more loving and lasting kind of love, a heavenly love. The love of the creator of the stars who also carefully created her exactly as she was meant to be. And that will preach, my friends. I have no issue with that narrative. Thanks be to God for the eternal love of our creator and redeemer. Can I get an amen? But I think when we view this story through the lens of modern Western culture, we miss something. I mean, who's been married five times? Liz Taylor? Zsa Zsa Gabor? Those women might have used men to get power, but they also had the agency to freely walk away from those men if they chose to do that. And you know what? That wasn't necessarily true in the days of the Samaritan women. This particular woman, I think she may be a, a victim of what's known as victim blaming. And if you're not familiar, victim blaming is when part of, or all of the motivation for harm is placed on the person harmed. In other words, she was asking for it. Well, why didn't they just walk away? They shouldn't have been in that part of town. It's saying that if only the victim had been smarter, more modest, wiser, more pure, then they wouldn't have been hurt. And people who have experienced assault and abuse will tell you that the shame from victim blaming can be as horrific as the actual assault or abuse. We don't know what kind of family the Samaritan woman came from. We can't know how old she is or if her father or brothers were in the picture when Jesus met her or before then, but we can know this that she lived in a time and a place when women were little more than livestock. Her options were so limited to be non-existent. It is likely that a year or so after she started menstruating, her father sold her. Her buyer was most likely a much older man. So here she is, 14, maybe 16 years old, being given to an older man for him to use her however she, he wants. She'd be expected to give in to whatever he asked of her, whether that be sexual favors or household labor, if he chose to beat her or deny her food or make her sleep on the floor with the animals. He could. Maybe he did that. Maybe he didn't. But the point is that all the power was in her husband's hands. And at some point, that man cast her aside. And we don't know why and we don't know when, but we know that she was divorced. And we know that women had very few legal paths to file for divorce. So now she is no longer a virgin, which according to the custom of the day, means her value is diminished. She isn't allowed to conduct business on her own or own a home of her own. She is damaged goods. But she does find another man to take her in and she gets married again and cast aside again, and again, and again, and again. 
And then she finds that last guy. He hasn't married her, but he's keeping her. A man would, who would keep a woman like that in that society was no one that held any respect in the community. A respectable, well-educated, well-employed man in Samaria might have a mistress or a concubine, but he wouldn't just be living with his girlfriend. It wasn't done. The woman in this story has been given over, sold, or cast aside by six men, by everyone who had ever had any authority over her. Now I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. No, I'm not going to ask you that because we're on, on a computer. <laughs> No, we don't have to raise your hand, but I assume we've all felt the sting of rejection. Put yourself in the shoes of the woman in the story, truly. Rejected again and again and again and again and again. I feel safe in saying that at this point in the story, the woman had a complete and total lack of self-worth. The women around her had loyal husbands and children and families that cared for them while she had nothing except this low life who was willing to take in a woman of no value. Then along comes Jesus, a Jew. And no one despises the Samaritans the way the Jews do. They are a hated race. They're considered despicable, filthy, rejected by God simply because of the political wars and power plays of the past. Add to that the fact that single Jewish men do not just sit down and strike up a conversation with a single woman. It isn't done. In fact, it's downright scandalous. This woman is used to scandal, though. Her entire life has been ruled by it and She's, even she is shocked that Jesus would do such a thing. The Message Bible puts it like this. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, asked, How come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? In my mind, Jesus just offers a kind smile and shakes his head and says, You don't understand. If you understood how outrageously generous God is, you would be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh living water. There's an exchange between the two of them. She thinks he's lost his mind, talking about living water that will prevent you from ever being thirsty again. He doesn't even have a bucket to draw the water with. I mean, it's all nonsense. If you have a drink right now, you should take a sip of it. I have this bubbly, slightly flavored water. And it's clear. It's refreshing. This isn't a commercial for this brand or anything, but... But in... From that little drink, it won't take long that you're going to want more. And it probably will only be a minute or so. And you think it's nonsense, right? Living water that quenches your thirst forever? But Jesus just smiles and nods again. That's right, he says. And he launches into another crazy statement. The Jews might be the path God is using to provide redemption, but redemption is not only for the Jews. Um, And this is where I'm going to, as I told you, that's um, Elizabeth's sermon and her writing, but I'm going to interject I, Brian, or Pastor Brian. I'm going to sneak into Elizabeth's sermon for a moment. Redemption, I just want to say, redemption is not only for the Jews, but for everyone, right? And that's what she's saying. There's a moment in the story where this is what she's talking about. The woman asks Jesus about a long-time ancient issue between the Jews and Samaria. She says, the Jews say God is to be worshipped in Jerusalem, and we say he's to be worshipped in Samaria, up on this mountain, So what's the answer to the issue? What's the truth? And Jesus answers, a time is coming and all, and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the Spirit and in truth, 
God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. You all, whoever's watching this right now, you have that spirit within you. You have the kingdom of God within you. Wherever you are is the place of worship. Wherever you are, that's the place of worship. The place upon where you are standing is holy ground. And it's not in a particular building or a particular place. Yes, it's good to gather together in a church. Uh, churches are important. But wherever you are standing is holy ground. Wherever you are standing, you are worshiping. That's the time to worship. Worship without ceasing. And let the people see how we worship through our kindness. Well, this has been a public service announcement. Now back to our regular scheduled program. Back to Elizabeth. <laughs> and she writes, everyone will be saved when the Messiah comes. Everyone will drink of the living water. It's free for all. Jew, Gentile, and yes, even Samaritans. Even women. Even humans who have been rejected over and over again by their neighbors. God sees you. God loves you. God has set redemption for you. And when I picture this, the woman sighing, saying, I don't know about all that, but I suppose when the time comes, we will find out, won't we? And Jesus tells her, the time is now. Now, I am he. You have been redeemed. Don't take those words for granted. He's telling this person who feels utterly worthless, who feels like nobody wants her, who feels she is just a burden to society, that the God of the universe, the creator of the stars, the maker of heaven and earth, the Alpha and the Omega, sees you, loves you, has come to rescue you and reestablish your immense, immeasurable value. And what was the effect this had on the woman? Did she go back home that evening and casually mention it to her boyfriend? No, she raced back to the city and she told everybody, everybody she could find, the Messiah has come, he's here. As Sandy Patty said it, I've just seen Jesus and I'll never be the same again. Friends, I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes it's hard to get up here on Sunday morning. It feels a little like I'm preaching to the choir because quite literally I am. Because our choir members are in the congregation. <laughs> We've all probably heard this story before, though, is the point. We've all probably heard all the stories before. But have we stopped registering what we hear? We hear, but are we listening? Have the stories of Jesus become like those old bulletin boards in the back of our churches or the cluttered up corners or the boxes that have accumulated over the years? Have we seen or heard it so many times that it no longer affects us in any meaningful way? We all want purpose. We all see the darkness and the pain in the world, and we long for it to be better. We thirst for it. Others thirst for it. And I'm here to tell you that you, the believers, those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, have the power within you to make it better. The kingdom of God, the spirit of God, the life breathed into you by God is within you. But there's another half to that truth. The spirit of God is in every single person you meet. No exceptions. I, I paused because I just it reminded me of a a little um, cartoon caption, a single frame where Jesus says, love everybody. And some guy yells out, what about Phil? 
Yes, even love Phil. <laughs> I don't know. But there are no exceptions. The people you like, the ones who rub you the wrong way, the annoying people, the bubbly people, the people who think like you, and the people who sputter nothing but nonsense in your ears, the political people, the apathetic people, the kind people, the miserly people, miserly, the hussy who's on her sixth shady relationship, they are all made in the image of God. And if you leave here today and you see them, see them. Not just their outward appearance, but see them the way God saw the woman at the well. See the spirit of God in every person you meet and honor that spirit because you're honoring God by doing so, by treating them with respect and offering them the unrelenting, eternal, boundless love of the God who made us all. And when we do that, lives will be changed. They will race to tell others that they have just seen Jesus and they'll never be the same again. And one individual at a time, the thirst will be quenched. The darkness will roll away. And that, my friends, is heaven on earth. Amen. Well, as we go to our closing hymn, I just have to say that it bothers me that Elizabeth wrote a better sermon than I probably ever have and did it within 30 minutes. So I'm really upset about that. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious, no. But I really appreciate Elizabeth for um, offering that up. So let's go to our closing hymn. One of my favorites, Be Thou My Vision. And I hope it's one of yours too. So let's go to the Lord in song. Raise up as we conclude our service today.
Well, <clears throat> I don't know if you were wondering. You probably weren't. At least I never thought much about it in church. But um, I chose that song because I typed in uh, on good old Google, uh, what is what are some of the most Irish hymns written? And that was like the, the highest one on the list. So, and it's one of my favorites. So that maybe because I'm Irish, I like it a lot. Anyway, well, thank you for joining us in worship today. And and I did forget to mention, you know, we still are in our Lent season. We did have a wonderful Lent service at our church Wednesday night. And I want to thank everybody for getting involved in um, cooking the food for people, getting the plates ready and the tables ready and making it beautiful. So thank you. If you're watching this, thank you for all you did and continue to do. And uh, so it, I pray that your Lent, whatever you might have given up or whatever you've added to your life is going well. And I pray that you continue to be lifted in the spirit as you do go through any fasting or anything like that. So God bless you all. Uh, drink deeply of the waters of salvation. Quench your thirst for truth, for the Lord is with you. The Lord is in you. Go in God's peace and bring the good news to all that you meet. Amen. Amen. Wonderful to worship with you today. I look forward to seeing you very soon, and God bless you all. Take care. Bye-bye. And remember, always keep your eyes on the heavenly things as often as possible, like Jesus and tacos.